In the following film, Yvette Roundtree, an advanced practitioner in zoological medicine and honorary assistant professor in exotic medicine at the University of Nottingham, demonstrates how to spay a guinea pig with ovarian cysts. So we're starting off giving an intramuscular injection of metatomidine ketamine and methadone and then leaving her back with her sister to go to, off to sleep. Now Babel is a bit more settled. She's having subcutaneous meloxicam, meropitin and some fluids. And then we'll settle her on inhaled isoflurane using a face mask. We're just checking the little lump that she's got because we're going to be removing that as well. So Mabel is nicely asleep, she's had her fluids and her meloxicam and meropitant. So Mabel is about three and a half. We're spaying her um, for, because we're suspicious of ovarian cysts. Um, she's a recent rescue um, and uh, a relatively hormonal young lady. And actually the cysts are palpable on her. Normal routine approach the abdomen. Now, if this was a younger guinea pig, some people do flank spays or flank overectomies. I must admit, I don't. Um, mainly because my um, patient base just isn't, I don't often do, you know, it's, it's unusual that I would be doing young um, females. Usually it's the older girls, and I just prefer the access I get this way, and I can check that there's no uterine pathology a bit more easily. But if I was doing a younger pig, I would probably go more cordially. Um, avoid touching that cecum. But I know that I've got cysts here, so I don't, I want to go a little bit, make my exteriorization a little bit easier. Where are you? No, don't want you. So that's actually spleen. That's the fat attached to the spleen. We don't really want that. Bless you. Do you mind just moving the light round so it's coming straight on for me, please? Ah, oh, much better. Thank you. That looks like broad ligament fat. That is broad ligament fat. Rodents are nicely designed by having a fat pad where we want uh, attached to things that we want. It's always useful. Oh, my sweetheart. Oh, there's my ovary. Well, not mine. I wouldn't want one that looked like that. That heart rate just coming up just a little bit. Yeah, she's just feeling well. Just understandably responding to that a little bit because that's got to be uncomfortable. Some people do drain these percutaneously before surgery. I'm not a big fan myself. 
There we go. Ruptured Warwick Bend, it came out. Um, mainly because I'm always scared about, put, I'm always very cautious about putting a needle into the abdomen of a herbivore because there's an awful lot of gut and I don't really want to poke that. That's actually a pretty modest one compared to some, isn't it? Um, but it will feel a lot better for her once that's out. The jury is out a little bit. I know there are a lot of, exo a lot of vets who don't particularly think these are uncomfortable, you know, cause much of a clinical problem. I hesitate to say potentially those might be people that haven't had ovarian pain themselves. Certainly we know that these guys can be incredibly painful and I'd rather not risk it. Nice. So I think that'll be the worst bit for her because that pulling's over with. Come on, you. There's a big, there's a reasonable fat pad there. It's not like on a dog when you've got a, a big, a lot of fat around the uterus and it tends to just cheese wire. These kind of hold together quite nicely. But modified Miller's knot does make things a lot easier. That was my nurse chuckling because I always use a modified Miller's knot because she knows I like them. Now I finally learned how to do them. That's the beauty of having vet students. That they can teach you techniques that weren't invented when you were at uni. say for those of us that are dinosaur vets there was a discussion recently saying don't call yourself a dinosaur vet that makes you sound unvalued I'm, like, I'm quite happy to be a dinosaur as long as I get to be a cool one there we go so you can go back in there little ovary or little pedicle I hope that's not the ovary and follow it down so there's that typical gonad fat pad that we see on all our rodents which I think makes our lives much easier. It's not the happiest looking uterus either, actually. It's a wee bit fluidy. And there's ovary number two. Let's just make that incision a wee bit bigger. We always worry with, or generally we worry with small furries, and particularly with the hindgut fermenters. We're quite often concerned about touching the gut and are we going to cause gut stasis? Well, yes, you could do, but actually we're not touching that gut very much. And that's an advantage of going for the fat pad rather than going for the ovary itself, because you find the fat pad, that's a lot easier to find. Now that's, again, that's a pretty decent size. The Doppler, but she's breathing nicely still. Okay. The Doppler's having a temperamental day, I think. Yeah. She's... So normally we would have the Doppler on. Actually, I can hear something on it. I can, I can hear, I, maybe I can hear breathing. The Doppler's much easier for having a heart, keeping a, a monitor of a heart rate without having to keep poke around on a small thing with a um, stethoscope. And then anaesthetic circuit wise, we're a standard T piece, but instead of having a normal bag, we've got a balloon. Um, just closes down that dead space a little bit. Um, and it makes us feel special. Now, we don't, we don't routinely intubate guinea pigs. They are very, very difficult to intubate. 
and uh, I don't know anyone that routinely intubates these guys. We do intubate all our rabbits um, with small furries. What we do, with rodents, what we tend to do is have a mask, but have it um, secured via a suture to the upper incisors, which keeps it nicely in place. Um, obviously, there is the risk of leakage, but actually, if we've got a nice seal, it doesn't tend to, we don't seem to get much leakage. Certainly, our eyes of fluorine monitoring is within the accepted limits even though we do the vast majority of our ops, the small fairies. So ovary number two can go goodbye. Ruptured, Sorry? Ruptured. Hadn't ruptured, no. Just <laughs> yeah, we, we thought we might have ruptured it pre-op, but I think either it had moved or it was bigger than that to start with. Could have been. Um, they're, you know, they're a decent size, but they're still... Uh, we see a lot larger, let's put it that way. But I've also seen a lot smaller that have been causing consider you know, significant pain. So size is not everything. And there's our ovary, there's our uterus. She just looks very hormonal and she is a very hormonal pig. She was actually showing signs of estrus yesterday. She was being very flirty at home. Off this oh, is she? Yeah. Mm, fair enough. <laughs> um, Ellie, I'm just having a little bit of reaction when I'm pulling tight there. Um, and her sister was had the same op on Monday, so two days ago. And if you were to look at her now, unless you tipped her upside down to see her wound, you would have no idea she had major surgery two days ago. And her cysts were three or four times the size of these. We did not get them out intact. Um, so definitely, this is a pretty modest cyst. Oh, I'm not convinced on that one. So I'm just going to do... I don't tend to dissect down all the fat just because there's a lot of it. But actually, she's very chunky there. So obviously, these are a lot easier if you've got a younger animal rather than one that's massively hormonally active. Remember all your small fur, most of our prey species do prefer to lay down fat internally, which is why your rabbit spay, your older rabbit spays are usually really fatty and not very fun to do. But our rodents are the same. Come here you. Come here little Liga chap. From a welfare point of view, I think this is going to make this can make a massive difference to these little ladies. As well as it being a a direct pain thing, we do see a big increase in um, there's, because there's quite a strong association, at least anecdotally, in female guinea pigs with ovarian cysts and urinary disease. Um, probably because it's actually quite painful to wee. Oh, it's it's painful to posture. And I can't demonstrate because I'm not, well, A, I'd look silly, and B, you can't see me because I'm on the other side of the table. But guinea pigs tend to posture to urinate, boys and girls, by um, tilting their pelvis quite markedly backwards and peeing behind them. Which is good because if you're a boy guinea pig and you don't do that, you tend to just wee on yourself and then sit in it. Because we all know that boy rodents are quite mucky. Um, so if you, but if you can't do that, you're not going to fully, uh, that's fine. So if you can't posture like that comfortably, you're not going to fully empty your bladder. And then the longer that blood, that urine is sat there, the more likely you are to get, um, crystals forming in the urine. And we do get, certainly in both sexes, we get kidney stones, less commonly. We do get urethral stones. Uh, sorry, ureteral stones. Most of them are in the bladder or in the um, urethra. The girls also have, um, can get a accumulation of debris at the clitoral fossa and they can be huge and those are exquisitely painful. So we know that that is probably the part of the body that has 
potentially the highest number, or the, it's one of the most sensitive parts of the body, and for obvious reasons. And if you've got a stone there, and every time you go to urinate, it stretches against that, you're not going to posture properly. And those can get big really quite quickly. So that's something that we should always be checking our female guinea pigs for, is for a stone accumulation in that area, because they are exquisitely painful, um, and I think can be quite a significant issue for them. Could I have another three knot Vicryl, please? Oopsie. Yeah, I'm not going to fuss with that. I'm going to just use a new one, I think. We're going to need it anyway, so thank you. So we're a routine three-layer closure. I do tend to, on guinea pigs and rats, and anything smaller, we tend to do a um, simple continuous on the linear alba. If it was a rabbit, I'd probably do simple interrupted. That will bruise out. Just turn it down again because I managed to move the doctor back in place. Awesome. So it's dropped, dropped. That's the... it. Oh, cool. So she's, a, she's much more comfy now, isn't she? I'm not surprised without that all pulling her out. That can't be very nice. We did have a guinea pig last year, when you'd started with last year, wasn't it? That had um, significant ovarian pain. She had follicles and we were wanting to get her into spay and every time she ovulated, she had massive pain um, to the extent she was getting hospitalized. So in the end we had to go, you know what, let's just do it and get her through the gut stasis. And she actually hasn't looked back. She's doing fantastic. I saw her yesterday and she's doing fantastically well. Um, so it is something that I think we under-recognise as vets and as owners. You, other, t other things you can do from a treatment point of view. In theory, you can use um, hormonal control um, to resolve them. Well, basically to induce ovulation. We always used to use Coriolan. Now, last time I looked at it, at whether we could get hold of it, we couldn't. I'm not sure if it's back on the market. My issue with it is that it only works on a small proportion of them because up to 80% of these aren't hormonally active, so it's not actually going to do anything for those cysts. It's not going to get rid of them. Um, it's an IM injection, and it can be quite painful. And these guys only get, get one IM injection. That's one anesthetizer. And the other thing is it does tend to... Um, they do tend to recur. So... Traditionally, and I have used it in the past, where I've had people that, you know, three, four, maybe three or four-year-old guinea pig that they've said, oh, you know what, she's a bit old, don't really want to put her through surgery. But when that guinea pig then lives till they're eight, and they're having Coriolan injections every six months, that gets really expensive and not very nice. Um, so increasingly, and partly that's because we do a lot more anaesthetics now, we're, we're happy with our protocols. Um, and our success rate. So we do tend to go mainly for surgery. can understand, you know, sometimes people don't like doing it. I always explain to people if they're worried about the, the statistics that are put out, are published for um, anaesthetic deaths, I always point out, particularly in, in exotics, some of those stats are going to include vets who don't know what they're doing, vets who aren't used to dealing with these species, it might potentially include um, protocols that haven't got um, much pain relief compared to ones that have got a lot of pain relief. Also, it's going to include those animals where they're an extremist, but all we can do is surgery. And that is very different to a kind of semi-elective surgery like this. There we go, little. Oh, hang on. You know what, Ellie? I've just done a whole videoed one without getting a knot in my suture. Mm. That never happens. The usual rule is if I do, if I video something, we get a knot in my suture and then I get very cross. So, 
There we go. Almost time to wake her up. Okay, if you stop it now, it's fine. I'm having intramuscular atopamazole. Yes, she has got another wound there. That was just a standard mass removal. And then we'll be keeping her on the oxygen, keeping an eye on her temperature um, until she's woken up.